Hello and welcome everybody to the Buy Around interview show. We've got a very special guest here with us today. Um, joined by a man that played with a fantastic combination of skill and aggression. Uh, 200 plus NRL games, 18 for New South Wales, 17 tests. Spot on. A couple of games there over in the Super League as well. I think over 300 professional games. Yep. Greg Bird, yeah. How are you, mate? I'm very well, mate. It's, um, it's quite the career. Looking back, you must be. Um, yeah, it is. I played. Proud, I, yeah. I played for a long time. Um, if I didn't get suspended for forty-five odd weeks, I probably would have had a few more games is on that there. What it is, forty-five. Yeah, I think I had about about twenty-five to thirty here, and then about fifteen overseas. <laughs> it was it was good times. It probably prolonged my career. Helped me <laughs> helped me to get out to that 18, 18 yeah. season mark. But um, that was good. I actually played at Southport last year and didn't get one suspension. So, no. on that. <laughs> no match review committee up there, is there? <laughs> no. <laughs> if the referee misses it, it, it gets missed. Mm -hmm. um, mate, we, um, we've just been on a little run together as well. Um, we've come straight from that. How's the, uh, the, the body holding up? And um, oh, I struggle to keep up with you boys. Every time I run with Nick Youngquist, um, he says it's going to be an easy run. Don't worry, it's slow. And then after a few Ks, he's, he just runs too fast. He's a greyhound. But, uh, yeah, I'm, my body's pretty good. Shoulders are good. Knees are good. It's just a um, short little fat body. It doesn't really move well um, on, those, on those long runs. Yeah. Um, so you, you did finish um, over at Catalan, but then you, before we get into you retiring over there, you came back and you, you played last year for the Southport Tigers. Yep. What, what was... Um, what was behind that? Like, um, I'm just thinking myself. I'd I'd really struggle to go into that um, that that level and with that sort of target on your head. And yeah, well, mate, I really enjoyed it. To be honest, he asked me if I want to come, and I, and I said no chance. I couldn't think of anything worse. And then uh, he said, "Oh, Clive Palmer owns a club. It's going to be." <laughs> oh, <laughs> and what was his wallet? <laughs> uh, so yeah. I, Get through a bit of cash and had a bit of fun and met at the start I'd, I didn't know anyone and um, you know basically went there for a bit of cash and then um, I, I'll come back this year coaching just for the love of the club um, had a really good time out there we won the comp and this year I've got coaching the 20s and it's I, I really liked all the people like back to grassroots football um, brought a lot of it was a lot of fun that I sort of leaves leaves you when you become a professional athlete and you forget about all the the fun things uh, mucking around after training and this and that and yeah, just the enjoyment just the and enjoyment just, yeah and yeah it's it not, not being scrutinized and just yeah basically and um I had, I had a ball yeah. yeah it I think it's a nice way to finish that because that I think I don't don't want to put words in your mouth, but I, I assume that's where, that's how you started. Like from enjoying yeah. and loving the game and then it becomes all serious and... Well, it becomes a job. Yeah. Well, it is a job, but you still have the passion and the drive and all that, but you lose that little bit of fun because it's, you have to be professional all the time. Um, up there, there was no, there was professional in the way you played, but when off the field, it was just have a good time and, um, you know, Try to try to get the best out of the blokes around you. It was, it was we had a good team. We, we had a few NRL players. Michael Oldfield, um, he come and played. Sione Katoa, um, he he played. Um, so we had a pretty stacked team, but um, that was good fun. Do you have a target on your head? A little bit, a little bit. People, but the game was a lot slower, and um, I, was, I was playing out wide, so I could sort of know what was happening and. I was playing like left edge back row most of the season or half. And then you sort of watch what's happening and people will just go through the motions. They do their little block plays because that's what the coach told them to do. And you just wedge in and like wipe them out because you know what they're going to do. Um, yeah, it was all a bit easier in that sense. But yeah, the physicality was just the same as any level really. Right? Yeah. Like, you know, they're, they're all 110 kilos. They're big and they run hard. It's just... The level of skill is not quite there at that level, and um, yeah, it was it was it was easy to exploit, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> what what about the um, interactions with the with the crowd? Obviously, 
you know, you, you were loved it for, for New South Wales. <clears throat> loved when you were playing for New South Wales. Um, I know you did play up at the Titans, but obviously I think you got under the, the skin of some Queenslanders from time to time. Did, uh, did a few people like to remind you of that? Yeah, they did. Um, and I had to remind them occasionally that I wasn't playing in the NRL <laughs> and I could quite easily jump the fence. <laughs> um, yeah, people, people aren't accountable for their words these days. Um, and I'm across a fence on a, on a football field, they can say what they want. But so you got, a few, you got a few sprays from... Oh, I've got plenty of sprays, man. It, it, it didn't really bother me that much. It was more the fact that we were... We were we were losing. We weren't losing a game, but they were coming back and a team we should have been beating quite easily. Um, so I was sort of might have been feeling the nerves a little bit and I'd let a little lash out at a fan across <laughs> the fence. But, um, yeah, I did that occasionally at the NRL level as well. <laughs> so it wasn't that uh, different from normal. Mate, it's one of the – it's funny that because it's one of the things like I genuinely missed is – it's almost like that cough and a spray from a fan, like mm. as, especially in the Super League, because oh, they're good because, over there. Because the ground, you, you are so close to the fans, like yeah. literally like a meter behind you, and like Graham, you fat fuck, ginger bastard, you shit, you'll <laughs> never make it over there. And I'm like, all right, mate, yeah, geez, <laughs> like you turn around, there's some ten year old kid, and you're like, oh god, my yeah, my first game over in the Super League in 2009 when I come over. Um, I played at the sunny, sunny Wakefield. It was a beautiful stadium. Um, <laughs> and, um, and I remember starting on the bench because I'd just come from Australia. I'd had a few months off and um, straight onto the, onto the bench. And there was, it was when they could uh, add those rails that went along there. Everyone stands up against the rail and they're all standing right behind the bench and just spraying me for the first 20 minutes. They didn't say, I don't think they're watching the game. They were just spraying me, I was sitting on the bench. Um, and it was, it was like a good, nice welcome to Super League. Yeah. I think it was good. Don't worry, mate, you're not the only one to, to cop a spray at, at Sunny Wakefield and, <laughs> and you certainly won't be the last that they... That is, um, yeah, welcome to Yorkshire and everything that's great and horrible about the game of rugby league over in England can be seen in in one stadium there. They don't miss you. Yeah, it's... Um, no, it's not the most spacious place to get ready and um, play. I think there's only two grandstands on the field. The other two sides don't have anything at the moment. It's a pretty rough old place. Yeah, even, <clears throat> you know, you, you, you're over here. You know, we have some great f facilities, but then yeah, you go to France and Catalan's got quite a decent standard, but then, yeah, Wakefield, you must have thought, what the yeah. hell have I come to here? Because for those viewers and listeners that – that don't know. I think at Wakefield at the time you would have been sharing a toilet with the with the home team and the, the well, there, like was just one, the, there was one toilet next to the room and it was like right next to the seats. It was just like a door. It wasn't like blocked in. Yeah. So if someone walked in and went straight to the toilet, the whole sheds stunk. Yeah. Basically a shit. The strapping beds, they had to put them in the showers because there was no room. The room would have been about the same size as this for 17 players or 18 players yeah. around to get dressed. The roof was about half the height of this. So you sort of couldn't stand up straight really. <laughs> um, uh, it was it was different. And then you, we, you go to Salford. Oh, mate. And that was even shocker. worse. Also even, yeah. even harder. I can imagine. Worse or yeah, better yeah. Or, or <clears throat> more, more difficult. I can imagine them saying to you, oh, this is the worst, worst of the ground you'll, you'll play out, mate. And then, yeah, you get to Salford and Jesus Christ. You've got to walk, you got to walk through their fans to get onto the field as well. And they don't yeah. mind missing you with a, a bit, bit of a verbal attack there as well. Yeah, no, I really, I think that's something that definitely stands apart from Super League compared to the NRL is the, the fan engagement. They're mm. louder. There's, there's probably less than half in the grandstands compared to an NRL match, but the actual atmosphere and the noise and the banter and it's definitely they're the very very passionate yeah. bunch of people over there. It's same with, same with France. I know singing songs. Oh and, mate, there, yeah. there was nothing worse than getting off to a good start against Catalan, and then when 
it's, it's, they start to come back and chase you down and the fans are like, yeah. you're, you're just behind the sticks going, boys, we got fucking ripping off the kickoff and the fans are just booming out, alay, alay, alay. Yeah, they're good. And then you got um, Bernard Gosh, our, our president. If the ref made a bad call, he'd be like into the tunnel and abusing the ref. And it's <laughs> like... <laughs> Like that's passion. That's the yeah. passion over there. Like I loved, I loved him for that. Mm. I don't think that would pass if, if um, one of the one of the owners, <laughs> one of the club owners in the NRL tried to pull that, they'd be they'd be arsehole straight away. But um, over there, it's you know, you, you, I think I could commend people for their their passion. If it's not even if it's not the most professional actions, yeah. that's the people are acting with their heart. Yeah, they 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 love the game. Yeah. And that, I mean, you know what? I think I can remember that Bernard guy. Being in the tunnel, what Saints Catalan, there must have been something must have happened. He was, he was giving the ref like yeah, both barrels. If, yeah, it didn't didn't bother him. They'd be like Alex, um, they'd be like the football manager uh, uh, Alex Chan, and he'd be like trying to drag him away because he knows that he's going to get 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 sided by the Super League. But he's like, no, nah, get away, nah, just attacking him in French. Yeah. Wouldn't really take yeah. the English because <laughs> and then they could say, What did he say? He was like, Oh, he no, just, said, just said that was a terrible call and um I hope you have a safe flight back home. <laughs> <laughs> that's not what he said. No, no, that's what he said. Pretty what, sure. What was he like in in the dressing room? So I've heard that like as an owner, um, you know, like news filters through. Um I heard he was he was pretty full on to to his players and let let you know, he let the officials knew what he think, but he also let his players he knew did. what he think as well. But he, he he loved well, he liked me because I sort of went out with that same attitude. I was like a bit of a firebrand, and but the players that were played with a little bit more skill, if their skill wasn't on that day, they'd probably cop. They could cop quite a big spray. Um, yeah, we put. I remember early on when I went in '09, um, and he set everyone down, and I think we I can't remember who we got beat by, uh, but he was walking around the room fingering people. <laughs> Your shit, blah, 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 blah. look how big you are. Like this is all in French. As yeah, well. and I had to actually know a little bit of French to know what he's talking about. Um, yeah, look how big you are. You're you're a big cat. And then he's like, it's just personal attacks. It wasn't yeah. just, it wasn't just um, sort of blase uh, over the whole room spray. It was, he, it was personal. And then, but it was because he cared. Yeah, it was he, because he cared. If you don't want to be here, go back to Australia. We're paying you too much anyway. Like he, he didn't hold back, but. Um, yeah, I loved him. I, I really, really, really loved him. I uh, consider him a good friend and uh, I can't wait to get back yeah. there to visit all those guys. I had a, I had a great time in France. Yeah, we'll we'll get over it. We'll, we'll get into some of the, the, the tales of, of playing over in Catalan. But when you when you finished there, um, that was at the end of 2019, just before COVID, and you took up a job um, coaching there. Yep. Um, how was that? transition from being a professional athlete but then you're in a foreign country um covid hits so there's there's a lot of process but then also you you're isolated from you know here which is your home and in a, a, a foreign speaking <coughs> country and, and and all that you know i think it just the degree of difficulty was greater yeah. Just to the fact of your, your location and through no fault of your own either. Yeah, it was a lot to process, definitely. Uh, you have, when you retire from professional sport, I played for 18 years professionally. Um, and it was a lot to process to actually, you know, retire and get over it. But with everything else going on, it sort of it took a little bit away from what I was actually doing, um, or what I wasn't doing anymore. Um, it was more harder for me for my more harder, it's probably not great English. It was, it was more hard for me for my family. Yeah. Um, you know, the kids weren't going to school anymore. My wife was even more isolated than she was before that because she didn't really speak a great deal of French. She didn't have, um, you know, she had a couple of friends, but then that they she really used as a, a crutch over in, over in France, isolated from, um, you know, being able to speak her, her mother tongue, being able to speak English. Um, so the fact that she could then she couldn't go see them made it really difficult. Um, the kids locked in the house for I think the first lockdown we had over there was like three months um, straight, and that was like proper hard lockdowns as well. Yeah, it, it, was, it was 
more strictly enforced over there, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't like you can do anything. I think you could. You had to have an attestation, which is like a little note, and you had to fill it out. What time you left? This is how long you you'd left for. If they found that you were past the time that when you wrote it, um, you weren't allowed to go more than a kilometre from your house. You could only go to a doctor's or a grocery store. Um, you had to have an actual specific reason why you were outside your house and if it weren't, they'd give you on the spot a couple hundred fine. Um, so, yeah, it was it was different times. But, yeah, because uh, we thought it was bad here where I think they put in the 5K rule but um, you, which, you know, a lot of people suffered um, but obviously <clears throat> most people were, you know, proximity to the beach. You could still go out exercise. Yeah. Um, stuff like that, but there was none of that happening over there. And and I guess as well, another factor to consider is, you know, for, for for you, your wife and your kids. Say if you were there, and it's difficult, it's still knowing that you can come back here. Mm. But that option would have been completely taken away from you. So it's not well, it's not like oh, if things get really bad or a need to go back, I can. It was just that that's gone, which again I, adds to the anxiety and the pressure well that's what actually ended up happening um well I, we stayed there two years coaching and i was still involved in the game and the highs and lows of rugby league so you had those passions and those those buzzes they were they were good so but then when the season finished for me um we had like a five month period where we couldn't get back to australia we couldn't get a flight so it was no longer employed i know no income i was in france and like the head was spinning, we couldn't get home. Uh, our flight was cancelled. Um, we got rebooked on another flight, and then they said, "Look, we can't even book you on a flight. We can't even change your flight. You just got to have to wait." Basically, this was from September, and then we couldn't get one October, November, and then we ended up getting like repatriation flights from the Australian government. Oh, really? Um, to get out, but basically get out of France. We had to catch a um, catch a train to Germany. And um, jump on a plane from Frankfurt and direct to Darwin, and we did quarantine in Darwin. Oh, did you? Yeah. So that was that was our escape of the COVID COVID European adventure. And the, and you did the two weeks quarantine. Yeah. What, what was it? What was it the, like the, there? The second we got out, they canned it. So oh. I, was like, I was like, oh god. <laughs> Why don't we come out two weeks later? Um, yeah, it was hot. It was hot. It was, would have been 40 degrees. Even if you're sitting outside, it was you had to be inside, but then you wanted to come out for fresh air. We had like four diners, like they were like on, a, on like a with a bal- long balcony, and we had like one per kid, one per kid, and then one for me and my wife because they were like single beds. Um, it was a bit strange, but it was, there was a bit a bit of space, and then. The police would be walking past at all times, telling us to put our masks on. In in Darwin. Yeah, they, they were like security, and that army coming through, running the security as well to make sure everyone was abiding by the rules. And and then my kid, my kids, my kid is a bit of a bit of a wild child. My youngest Eve, um, she just walk off and run run away and go for a walk <laughs> through through the compound, and um, the cops would go, "Where's your daughter?" I was like. I'm there. It's like, get her back. I was like, I'm, I'm allowed to leave the balcony. <laughs> um, you, you better go get out. He's like, you need to keep her on the balcony. I was like, mate, if you ever knew my daughter, you know, this, this is going to be pretty hard. She's three. Yeah. You try to tell a three-year-old that she has to stay where she is and she doesn't want to be there and I can't chase her. <laughs> do your yeah. best. Um, because yeah. if you left, they do the big six again. You yeah, wipe, they wipe can, it back they to two. Back, yeah, wipe yeah. it back. And then they can actually they they sort of keep you separated. And if someone actually they test you every day for COVID, um, and if someone tests positive, then they put you in a, into another section, and then you got to stay there for another two weeks. And then they actually test everyone in your immediate vicinity, and they've got to go into that section as well. And oh, like, so if anyone, yeah, so, but but no one on our flight had it. No one on our flight um, that came over had COVID. I don't think. Yeah. And then uh, we all passed our two weeks and. And got the hell out of Dodge. Yeah, I, I did the two weeks in a in a hotel quarantine here. Yeah. It was with the family. Yeah, rough. A bizarre, yeah. bizarre experience. Like, yeah, it was n- just weird, mate. Like, 
you know, we, we got pretty lucky. We got like a, an apartment style with a couple of bedrooms and a living room, but just a little balcony. Yeah, it's... Um, <clears throat> yeah, you, you learn a lot about yourself, don't you? Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of thinking time. We were to, like, um, we had, there was a group of other people, four people, there's uh, two couples on the other side. And um, we were doing like group um, training days. I'd like write a program and we'd be yeah. doing push-ups and listening to music loud. And then the cops would come past and they'd say, make sure you put your mask on. I'm like, uh. man, we are, I'm, I'm with, you know, only next to my family and the people on the other side are 10 metres away. Yeah, There's no way I can spit that far to get through them to inhale my COVID breath, which I didn't have. Mm. Um, yeah, that was sticklers for the rules, but um, yeah, that's all. So COVID doesn't even exist anymore, I don't think so. Uh, no, no, I can't remember the last time I found or seen a result or whatever. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. Th- thankfully we're, I think we're past it. Um, <clears throat> so when you, so you, you come back, you you do the season with the Tigers. Um, you're not playing anymore. You you hung hung the boots up. What 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 other in, what what's Greg Baird up to now, work wise? Um, well, I'm coaching the twenties up there for a bit of fun. That's down a couple of nights a week. Doesn't have much time. Um, and I started a, a business with with my cousin and Ryan James. Um, we're doing furniture removal and the sort of defit space. So when a office closes down or a business, or they they do a refurbishment, they. they uh, they got to do something with their old furniture before they hand their lease back. And before we had this business, a lot of them would just take it straight to the tip. Um, they'd get a removalist to come and drag everything out and take it to the dump. So really? I That's just couldn't believe it. Even even now I've spoken to um, hotel companies or whilst doing jobs and um, they tell us that the hotel emptying 200 beds out of a hotel room, out of a hotel, um, you know, 300 bedside tables or 400 bedside tables. And taking it straight to the tip, I was just, I just can't get, couldn't get my head around it. So we, no, I, well, I don't. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, we uh, take the furniture, um, and we source charities and community organisations, predominantly uh, indigenous, and um, we fill them with whatever they want, basically from the sites. A lot of the um, sites we have, you know, they've got desks, they've got lunch rooms with fridges, microwaves, dining tables. Um, we try to t- tell them everything that we've got. They pretty handpick, handpick what they what they could use, and then each job we do, we we nominate one one community outcome from it. So it is a little bit of a different business plan. Than a lot of the other ones, I think. Um, a lot of people recycle and pull everything out and recycle, but we've got more of a uh, a community outcomes. Yeah, like um, re reuse this reuse. equipment that is yeah. and to create that circular economies that people are gonna. Reuse items, um, not not having to worry about wastage and manufacturing costs and things like that. That keep things just putting things into the system and just circle, make it circular, and so things get reused until so they're actually dead. So you've just seen seen a gap in the market, or or seen not maybe not a gap in the market, but seen an opportunity to stop that waste happen and put this, you know perfectly usable like livable furniture yeah and put it to good use and people like a lot of the community organizations they don't have the funds to go out and buy yeah these things we've done some really good ones um work with a uh, indigenous welfare um service in sydney where we actually sold all the furniture and then bought household goods for a uh, a domestic violence relocation for a family and a woman and her kids so we got them like a, a lounge and gave them a fridge, microwave, dining table, chairs, um, then bought a bed and, and then pr- pretty much one site that we pulled out all went to put in someone's house uh, yeah. and someone's, you know, can actually have a home. Um, you know, you get given a house, a lot of these people get given a house. This is where you, where you can live but got no furniture in it. It makes it hard for people trying to... Or to actually be comfortable, be comfortable in their home if they've got nothing in it. Yeah, a, like a home isn't a roof. Well, uh, yeah, and and also when you're dealing with such a delicate situation like that, like you, you, they need all the help they can get. Mm. Yeah, we found there's a lot of people out there that need help and need furniture, and and are very happy with it as well. It's very yeah. rewarding in that sense that we 
you know, we're, we're doing an, like an environmental service, I guess, yeah. but not, not taking stuff to the tip and putting it in landfill. But at the same time, we're, we're getting some community outcomes and, and making sure everything gets reused. But um, it's been really good. Yeah. What, what's the business called? Sorry. It's called Project Net Zero. Project Net Zero. Zero. Yeah. We base, we can work, we work out every city basically. Yeah. And we're partnered with uh, Lloyd's Auctions. Uh, and they've got warehouses, Sydney, Brisbane, Melbourne, Adelaide. Uh, Perth, yeah, so we send trucks out, grab it, take it back to the warehouse, figure out our charitable donations and our community outcomes, and then the rest gets moved, basically. And this just came about you, your cousin, and Ryan. Did it, how long did it take to, to get going? Because usually, I guess, business plans, they yeah, take a lot of fine sort of, tuning. Was yeah, it, just a, it was very organic, really. It's yeah. sort of, we started with a few jobs and then sort of, how do we want to do it? Um, we figured it out and changed it and did it again and then that didn't really work so we changed it again and I think we've got a decent system now but it's um, yeah, it's still very early. We've been going for about five months. Yeah. So um, it's, yeah, it's, it's been good and it's put, put a lot of time into it. It's good to actually have it find a bit of purpose. So, you know, as we talk about playing rugby league, you have a schedule and, you, you know, where I've got to be on Monday morning, I've got weights, I've got... You know, yoga, then I've got uh, for a field session and then I've got video. You know, you know your whole day, you know your whole week. Mm. You know, basically know your year. Yeah. You know, you finish in October, you've got two months off and then you, you start starts all again. So when you retire, you, you, you've got nothing and you lose a bit of that purpose and that um, goal setting and um, figuring out what you want to do. So, and yeah, that was, sense of achievement yeah. that, and that satisfaction, like I can only imagine that like the satisfaction you get from when you've you, yeah, it's you, good. you make an you make an impact on people's yeah, lives. And you, you know you, when you're a player you go to schools and you see you do a bit of work with the kids and you know, they get a buzz from it. This is like that on steroids. You yeah. Just, people are walking away not just with happy moments because they've spent a, they're walking away with tangible items that they're gonna yeah. use and be really happy with and you know for some people they're gonna it's, it's a part of their home. So um, yeah, it's very rewarding in that sense, and um, hopefully we can keep keep taking it to bigger and better things, and get more clients, and you know, people out there that you know, that have these problems can give us a ring. Yeah, and, um, hopefully help them out. Yeah, definitely. We're going to take a quick break from the show to talk about our new partner, AG One. Now, I love AG One. I've been taking them for about six months now. I've noticed multiple health benefits. My gut feels better. My focus is more clear. Um, my intensity in my workouts has gone up as well. And this is all thanks to AG1. It's the one-stop solution for all your supplement needs. I love starting my day with a refreshing glass of AG1. So simple. One scoop in the glass, some cold water. Give it a stir. Or if you want to go fancy and get the shake, do that as well. But it's so easy. It takes out the guesswork with your supplement requirements. If you miss it in the morning, take it at night. I never miss a day with AG1 and I am reaping the rewards from it. And the best thing about it is it tastes great too. And you can really start to feel the benefits. Have it as a simple part of your routine and you'll see the benefits too. So if you're looking to make positive change with your health outcomes, check out AG1. You will not be disappointed. There's 75 high quality ingredients Take care of all your nutritious needs every single day. It's a small habit that you start and gets big results. If a comprehensive solution is what you need from your supplement routine, then Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. So to check out this exclusive buy round listeners deal, head to athleticgreens.com forward slash buy round. That's athleticgreens.com forward slash buy round. Your only place to get the free one year supply of vitamin D from Athletic Greens plus five free travel packs. Make sure you check it out or click in the show notes where we'll have that link for you as well. Please don't delay and get your Athletic Greens today. Talking about satisfaction, I think um, it's been rumored that you might want to take someone on, on in the ring and appeal to that sense of purpose again. Uh, it's been... It's been well reported. It's been reported that 
uh, you and Sam Thayday um, are, are lining each other up for a, a boxing match. There, there was even a quote in the paper from me. I actually haven't spoken to anyone. <laughs> not, oh, one right, so you... not one word. I haven't heard from anyone. I was more as surprised as everyone else when that, when that, they said uh, I was going to have a, a box match. Well, I'm happy to have a box match. I'll fight him. I reckon I've been covered. But <laughs> <laughs> he's, a, he's a bit tubby, a big semi. Um, I feel like I'm pretty fit. Yeah. Running with you this morning. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, a lot of boxers we'll do. A lot of boxers do start the day with them. Um, you know, sort yeah. of th- three mile, five mile run. So. Yeah. Um, I've had one fight. I had one boxing match in New Zealand. We did the fight for life. It was actually Gal's first fight. Um, Gal's first fight he had, and then he moved into a professional career after that. But um, he went over there for Fight for Life and me, it was me, Willie, Mason and Gal on the same card. It was good fun. Joe Parker actually fought on that card too. Oh, did he? Yeah. Joe Parker was one of his early fights in his career, but he was a headline act. Oh, I, I was a headline act, but Joe was the one after me. So so you reckon you'd <clears> – <throat> so like realistically, would you be keen to, oh, to fight mate. Sammy in particular or you'd, you'd open it up to any – queen? is, is there a – a demographic, demographic of person, as in like a, a, a New South Wales versus Queensland. Obviously, you're I'd very like to fight Gal. You'd like to fight Gal? Yeah. I reckon it'd be fun. It'd be entertaining. Like a street fight. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> We've had, we have, we have, had, we have come to blows in the street before me and Gaza. We lived together at Cronulla, so we come through playing together for our basically our whole career. Played rep football together, started at the same time. We used to butt heads quite a bit because we're both competitive blokes. We're yeah. Both, you know, very proud. What would usually um, stoke the fire? <sighs> well, girl's tight. So if you start spraying him about being tight and then I'm, everyone says I'm tight as well, but he's tighter. I assure you of that. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it'd be, it could be anything. I mean, Ricky Short pulled us aside one day and said, you boys need to, like, because we were sort of the, we, we were 20, Four, or he might have been 26. He goes, you guys are the senior players. you got a like, 24. <laughs> Hardly the senior player. He goes, well, everyone looks to you and you, everyone, and you two are constantly fighting every day. Um, you need to sort of tone it down a bit. I was like, we're just trying to win. We're like competitive. I'm like we'd be playing, you're playing in like an opposed session of touch or yeah. or tackle or held, you know, and we're trying to bash each other. And I was like, he said, it makes everyone feel uneasy. <laughs> no one knows if you guys are mates or what. But that was that was the dynamic we, we had, and we pushed each other to be better all the time, and yeah, yeah, it was uh, it was good. But you'd, but you'd still like to, to I still like to bash him. <laughs> I think he's getting a bit older now. He's slowing down. He's probably taking a couple of beatings, softening his head up a bit. Mm. I'm ready to come just in. Ready, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'll yeah, come just, finish him off. <laughs> 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 well, the, the the gal I reckon would be an option, but I think that like. I'll, Mate. I'm not a fighter, man. I'm a lover these days. Mm. I've well, got two girls at home. Yeah. They don't need to see me getting bashed up. No. And three, including my wife. Mm. <laughs> I, I reckon it'd be very – obviously, we're going to cover the, the origin periods, but to to see you go up against the Queenslander like Sammy thought I reckon it'd be pretty cool. Well, we'll see what happens at the end of the year. It's, I think it's written down. Well, that's what the newspaper said. It was going to be at the end of the, end of the season, so they seem to know more than I do. Which is always the way. Mate, we had... we had. You're a journalist now, so... Oh, don't you dare. <laughs> Mate, I see you on, on TV all the time, journalist. <laughs> oh, no. That's an insult. Um, Mate, because we actually had Jeremy Lattimore on last week, and... Um, he's he, a funny man. He's he's ready to box as well. He wants to... He's called out Paul Vaughan, but... Um, Paul is... No. I reckon he'd bash Latsy. You reckon? Yeah. I don't reckon Latsy. Latsy's jaw's too big. His head's too big. <laughs> he's just he, have a big, big target. It's a massive target. Big target. target. Yeah, yeah, you're he's right. He's got there. big long arms, but. Yeah. yeah. What about Latsy? Would you take Latsy on? <laughs> I don't think I could be serious actually and fight him because <laughs> no. he's so funny. Yeah, that, that would be He'd difficult. be cracking jokes. <laughs> um, I saw him on the field. He actually played in a, a nines tournament in Queensland a couple of weeks ago. Um, this is that's where I got this. That was really? My, that was the 
I was I got called to go, come and have a bit of fun, Zeb Taya. Um, did you play with Zebby? Yeah, did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a legend. Yeah, he's a great guy. He's got, he's running a charity up on up in Queensland, um, and he goes, I'm going to sponsor this team. Going to call it the Aim All Stars, and he's going to be a few of the boys have a bit of fun. I was like, sweet. He goes, hopefully we'll win and give a bit of money and it'll go towards our charity. I was like, yeah, no worries, sounds good. Uh, first game, um, I played and we were winning, and I went to make a tackle and got. Split and cloud everywhere. Mate, that's a it's a huge it was, cut. It's probably the worst cut I've had. <laughs> it was in a fun game of footy as at a thirty as a thirty nine year old. Um, Mate, yeah. it's ma- it's massive. It's made like, me real comfortable in retirement that this has. But Latsy's team, he was there, and I was watching him play, and he was just yapping away on the field, <laughs> and it was just they ended up winning the whole tournament. <laughs> Our team won the first game, and I went to the hospital. And because the hospital was next door to the fields in Rabina, and I just walked up there and and I was watching the games on my phone because they were televised. It was Anthony Mitchell's nines tournament. Anthony Mitchell, remember Anthony Mitchell, played um, for Para and the Cowboys, like the Roosters as well. Um, yeah, he's run a nines tournaments. Uh, it was really good, well set up, and um, yeah, lads, his team won it, and he was yapping away. But I watched watched all the games. We lost every game after that. I think we come second last or something in the tournament. Um, the boys, I think they might have been on the beers after the first game. Every other team was taking it pretty seriously. Yeah. We had a good team. Um, Jeremy Smith and um, Toddy Carney, uh, Eddie Pettiborn. We had a few of the old boys come out and have a run, but uh, it wasn't to be. Mm. It's definitely made me more comfortable in retirement. Yeah, I, I bet it has, mate. I couldn't think of much worse than strapping the boots on. Like any sort of lateral movement, I reckon my leg would fall off. It's that bad. Um, but yeah, I guess we'll watch this space when it comes to Greg Bird in the in the ring. In the ring. Yeah, I think the fa- the, the punters would love to see you and Thade go at it, mate. You could oh, be the bo- Queensland, the Queensland rivalry would be yeah. coming out of the woodwork. But bo- think- or box off, or mate, mate, Gal keeps saying he wants to fight Sonny Bill. I reckon you need to, you know, if, if Sonny Bill backs down, get a, get after it. Yeah. Be good to see the Bash brothers go up against each other. Like, <laughs> be something no one would be expected. <laughs> nah, it'll be fun. He's too good these days. He's so tough. Man, like, that's it. Like, he's had so many fights and he's about right at the top of his game. And I have to like bite him or headbutt mm. him or. He's done really. Mate, to I'd be probably fair, headbutt him. Like, probably open, open and round. Yeah. Headbutt on the beak. <laughs> <laughs> just Liverpool kiss. And then just see how he goes and see if it rattles him. Yeah, yeah. Mate, to be fair, he has done really well. And I love his honesty that he's just like, mate, I'm a prize fighter. Yeah. Like, get over it. I think he's done so much for actual boxing. Like, a lot of the people buying these cards, all these actual Australian boxers are on the cards underneath Gal. Mm. But they're only people are only buying the cards to watch it for Gal. Yeah. And the money's going back into the system. He actually donated a lot of the money. Uh, well, not a lot because he's a tight ass. But... We don't add some of the money yeah. um, to the other fighters as well, which I think he's doing. He's doing well for the, the Australian boxing. He, he probably, if he is as tight as they say, he's probably writing it off as some sort of tax deduction. He probably that's like, what know, he did. It actually turned out to be a net positive for Paul. He, he used to spray me for leaving my bedroom light on. He said he had, the, he had to pay the electricity. <laughs> it was in his name. <laughs> um, that's. Oh, he's uh, he's good. Is that? Are you being serious? I'm being dead set serious, like hundred percent. On my kids, he used to spray me for leaving my light on in my bedroom. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> oh, that's just one of many. He's got a few of me as well, but mm. but um, we'll leave those out. Yeah, yeah, fair fair enough. Um, I was going to say you, you you did form a um a pretty tight bond with Gal and a and a great partnership that. As known as the Bash Brothers, um, I don't know where they come from. I think Gal made that up. No, nah, I didn't. I think it was a Jenna. Yeah, money all mob. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it it did give you like a bit of a a bad boy image. Um, did you embrace that tag? I think I probably got the bad boy image some off field things as well. Um, you know, I was a young young man playing up here and there like everyone. Everyone does, but uh, as a rugby league player, you've got to be, you've got to stand yourself above that. And I probably didn't really understand that as much as a young man. Mm. But um, yeah, the bad boy image 
is that good with me? I like I like to play aggressive and um, you know walk that fine line between a penalty and a you know a great tackle or um, big contact. So um, yeah, I embraced it a little bit. I probably walked a little bit too far over. I think when I was younger, I I, <clears throat> I was very emotional in the way I played. Like I was like I actually was angry. I actually was trying to you know really I lost control. But I, I sort of honed it in as I got older and. Although I might have looked angry, I was actually pretty comfortable in the way I, where I was mentally on the field. So, but yeah, I, I enjoyed that. Um, I actually enjoyed that 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 image. Probably didn't help me when it come to um, my image off the field. Uh, when it comes to like now, now for example, to try to try to get try to get a job and in that sort of. Uh, but you were competitive. But it was just that a competitive it comes from competitive. It's not w- about any, anything else but yeah. but trying to win whatever it took to win. It and I think mate, it, it, it's something that should be admired. Like what you see is what you get. Yeah. Yeah, there was no... There was like, there's no, no bull, middle there's no ground bullshit, with you. Like really. you, know, you knew what you were going to get yeah. when you come up against you. Like you were going to you were gonna be in the face. You were going to be, you know... I think I'm upset you. Do you know actually... I've been thinking about this to Nick Toya. Um, I, I haven't actually spoken to you since we played that test in in um, in Melbourne. Oh, in and, um, yeah, yeah. Oh, we, we yeah, just we just yeah, yeah, I remember it. Yeah, and I stood on your hand in the game, <laughs> and then you got up and you sprayed me, and I, I laughed. <laughs> and I, when I remember, I shook your hand after the game, and I was like, "You right?" As your hand, and you. Do you just put, didn't ever look at me? Oh, really? Yeah, you didn't oh, ever look at me. I think you were. I think you were still like. I think you're cranky about the loss because it was a fuck. Oh, it was a fucking close one. That and was then you the, scored a try. Like that was just, Brian Hall's fingertip, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. And they said it was like it was a knock on. Mm. I think, and that would probably been the difference between making the actual what, the Four Nations. Yeah, final. yeah, it was. Um, and I, th- I think you're a bit filthy about that, but I've, I haven't spoken to you since, and I didn't even know <laughs> <laughs> whether you're still filthy at me because I stomped on your hand. No, but, I'm. You know, like I used to love when people put their hand like <laughs> you'd, you'd see them put their hand on the ground to play the ball, and you'd be getting up that marker, and you just go, you didn't like you look at their face <laughs> and then stomp straight on their hand, <laughs> like not looking at their hand and going, nah. oh fuck, it was no. like an accident. Like, yeah. Oh, sorry, mate. <laughs> no, it fucking wasn't. <laughs> oh. but yeah there's a few of those yeah i didn't mate you, you you've done a few of those as well to be honest oh mate it, it's the it, it it's all part of the dance isn't it like, yeah there's a couple of grand finals in a row wasn't it yeah yeah a bite a head bite well allegedly Alleged. allegedly <laughs> yeah um but mate it, it Shit happens on the. Uh, it does, mate. And... Yeah, it's a battleground. Mm. It's not a battleground like a actual war zone, but it's there's a lot of intimidation yeah. and physicality, and it all it all stays out there. For yeah, me. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm the same. Is... And I met that's it. Like because Youngy did message me, and I was like, I kind of forgot. Mm. You know what I mean? Like you yeah. just do. Like yeah. you just move on. Like it's just yeah. There's some people have done things like that to me, and I've, it's like you can. As soon as the game's finished, it's it's done. Yeah, yeah. I remember actually there's one thing that as soon as the game was finished, it wasn't done. Remember I played um, against South. It was a game that I need Shane Martini in the face and got suspended for 10 weeks. <laughs> uh, it was my third season. It was like 2004. Um, as I said, when I was young, I was a bit, a bit of off the off the hook. Um, but, yeah, I need him. In the, he was yelling. He, he kept yelling when he was getting, catching the ball and running off like kick returns yelling and he's annoying me they were beating us by 30 or something <laughs> and and i need him in the face he got 10 weeks but as i was walking off brian fletcher give me the best spray ever it was like wasn't a like a aggressive spray it was just a real well thought out and i, I thought about it for about 10 years until he interviewed me and i asked <laughs> him about it <laughs> he said uh yeah, it's your grub no one likes you i've spoken to your teammates and even they hate you and and I was like, has he spoken to it? <laughs> and I remember I went off into the sheds and I sat in the showers. I was like, I wonder who he's spoken to. Maybe he spoke to someone in origin. I was like, fuck that guy. <laughs> who in my team hates me? And I, I actually used it a couple of times, that, that same spray, after he told me the point of it. Because it actually yeah, worked. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Well, it's almost the biggest insult to say like oh, your you, mates, don't, your like mates don't like you. Yeah. 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 It got me. I thought about that for years, but <laughs> I, I like to leave all mine on the field. <laughs> Yeah, someone calling you a dickhead or you yeah. shit or mate, yeah. nice pass, whatever, or great hands. I used to love that one. Or someone like passed the ball, be like, oh, good, and like cause it, cause a knock on like, Oh, good hands, mate, great ball. That I want to see, mate. <laughs> Pat him on the back. You've been passing, you've been passing. Hey, Justin Horro was the best over there. He, he gives some of the best sprays I've ever heard. Like, constant. Yeah. Remember, we played Hull. We played Hull, and um, Connor was lippy all game. Oh, Jake Connor. Yeah, yeah, all game lipping up and Hozzy was into him and and then he'd be into him for this and that and he's pretty he's pretty fiery sort of kid as well. Um, and he, got, he ended up putting one out in the full and he go, mate, you're not the kicker, mate. You've lost the license. Don't just give it to the halfback. You know, what's the, the halfback's name? The Sneed. Sneed. He goes, easy kicker. You, mate, you've lost that license. You're an 18-year-old. Just go back to your wing. And he was getting that angry and that, that actually lost them. We ended up scoring that set and, and beat them. And we weren't good at that stage. We were pretty average. Um, he was uh, he was good at getting under people's skin, yeah. was he? Mate, Jake Connor, one of the most bizarre human beings, like super quiet off the field, but then get get him on there. He's a psychopath on the yeah. field. Yeah. But just yappy, psych, like not – I guess there's a few of them in the NRL, like blokes like that. Um, that you know, yeah, I wouldn't know because I'm not mm. out there. But you watch them, like, I love it. I think it's awesome. Mm. And you have people, um, you, you watch social media and you see people, like, spraying these blokes. And it's like, I love it. Yeah. Let them go. There's, like, rugby leagues. It's not just physical. There's a bit of talk out there. Yeah. On the be si- able, well, it's psychological as well. Yeah, you got to be able to handle that bit of yeah. chat. Because it can put you off. Well, like yeah. you're saying, that spray put you off your game. Yeah. Like, you, you can have that psychological yeah. warfare with people. And there's blokes, like, one blokes that you play with, Mickey Ennis. Mm. He used to get in under people's skin, like, better than anyone. And you walk off the field and he's like, you're like, he's like schizophrenic or something. Yeah. What's, <laughs> what's the go? Yeah. You're like a different person. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's part of the game. Mm. I love it. I love that part of the game. It's like a different aspect that, that you probably don't see on the camera as much. You see it now, and then everyone's blowing up after the game. And the Tigers, that Tigers Knights game the other day, everyone was whinging and whining yeah, about it. I yeah. was like, there's a bit of chat on the field, who cares? And everyone's speculating, oh, what did he say? Why doesn't he like him? Who cares? It's a game of football. Yeah, well, the same happened with um, Corey Horsburgh and uh, Royce Hunt, where they, yeah. they were, you know, Royce Hunt gave him a spray in the press conference, like two or three days after then, Corey Horsburgh puts up a video, a picture on social media, and it's kind of like, oh. I know. Yeah, it's all everything's sort of played out more in the media now yeah. than actually on the field, and people care so much because everyone's got that attachment. Like anyone can write anyone a message because everyone's got Instagram. Yeah, they're gonna write anyone can say anything to anyone. It's like no one's untouchable now. Yeah, and anyone, no one's accountable at all. Yeah. So they can say whatever they want. So the journalists can say whatever they want. Then people can comment on that, and then everyone's talking, and there's just this big debate about what has actually happened. It's, Someone doesn't like someone on the footy field. Yes, yeah, just a bit of handbags. Yeah, yeah. And um, well, mate, part of those the the attributes that that you used that that aggression, I think, really made you you stand out in Origin. Like, I speak to a couple of friends of mine, and they they're like, mate, I like f- just from around the traps and that, mate. We we loved Greg Baird in Origin. Like, we loved him. Like, yeah. what what you brought to that. New South Wales team with that the the way you played it was almost like made for you and it seemed that your game went to another level when you put on that sky blue jersey but sort of what was it about that arena that you you just loved was it the fact it was refereed a little bit differently or was it a, a hatred of Queenslanders a love for your state of New South Wales or a bit of a combination of them all yeah I think it was both I think it's a love and hate thing you know love for us bit of hatred for them. I think it's just the, that's the pinnacle. That's the best stage. It's the biggest stage with the best players, you know. Um, you, you play NRL, you play NRL, all the players that are playing in the NRL are in that, that game. You know, you play tests. There's Super League players and, you know, players you might not know, but in that game is the biggest players in the NRL. And on any given day, you can be the best player in the world, um, per se. Um, because you're beaten, because you're challenging yourself against the best players in the world. 
and it was a tough era to play footy in um, for me, being a New South Welshman through the, you know, the eight, eight series, I think it was, um, which was hard, but, um, you know, I went out and did my best to, to, to win those matches. I think we were so close for so long. Um, but physic- physically, I don't think that's where we lost it because, you know, we, we bashed them up a fair few times, but um, they just had that class. But, uh, you know, I, did, I never had the luxury of playing a great deal of semi-final football. You, you played in a thousand grand finals. Like, those, those were my grand finals. Those, those were my, my semis with playing Origin because, um, yeah, unfortunately I didn't get that, the luxury of playing in those big games. They, they were the biggest games I got to play in and I really enjoyed them. Yeah, what, what was the mindset like for you, for you going into that? Like, and, you know, <clears throat> like I said, I think you brought a lot of skill but that, that aggression was with the coaches tapping into that and saying like, man, we need you to get after them today. Where, where's the, where's, where's your psyche at as you're walking out in front yeah, of, it's, you know, 50,000 screaming Queenslanders? Yeah, 50,000, 80,000 in Sydney. It yeah. was like, yeah, it's, it's hard. I just sort of really, I don't really think about what I was thinking about back then. Yeah. Like I, um, it wasn't really coach driven. The coaches were talking about game plans and line speed and, you know, very sort of generic things. Mm. You know, you'd speak, you get a few little tips here and there, but um, for me it was just like doing my job the best I could and I'm trying to physically physically dominate that, that other, those other players. Um, you know, as we, we spoke about before, rugby league's not just scoring tries and, and skill. There's a lot of, you know, intimidation, physicality, you know, you get on top of a team physically and it doesn't matter, like, if you've got the most skillful players in the game in your team, you can't do anything if you're, getting, you're losing that physical armor. Yeah. Um, so that was somewhere we tried to get over them. Um, and that was some of the, you know, me and Gal and the other guys in, the, in our forward pack, Hoffy and Bo Scott and uh, Chucky Watmow, we'd, we'd try to, you know, play that aggressive style game and we beat them through the middle that that's that stages but as i said before the class of that little grub cronk and thurstow and smithy the dirtbag <laughs> no i actually love that <laughs> i love those guys and they're all good guys we played you know tests together and there's a lot of water under the bridge yeah it was good fun but so like you say you did obviously queensland it's a dynasty or dynasty i don't know what the pronunciation is but you got that victory in in 14 after so many years of being so close so mm. many years of hurt so many years of watching them pick up that trophy it was it was a long time <clears throat> it was a long time but and it was just relief really like like there was there were tears shed in those games some of those games we lost because you just think you put so much emotion and so much effort into something and and it, it was just felt like it was never going to happen um for me anyway like Eventually they'd win, but I probably would. I'd be too old, or they wouldn't. I wouldn't get picked, or and that was going to be the case. I was going to play eight, eight, eight series and and not get a win. So yeah, there were there's some dark days, but you know, fourteen was definitely a pinnacle in, in my career. Um, it's something that stands out probably the most, and uh, it was good to finally get that monkey off the back. Mm. Celebrate pretty hard after. Yeah, we celebrated. We had a few beers, a couple of quiet ones. <laughs> we stayed at the Pullman for like a week. <laughs> no, actually, I think I had about to play that weekend. That's the the beauty of uh, state of origin football. You got to back up, yeah, which is difficult. But um, yeah, it is what it is. Yeah, well, I know, I know being there. Obviously, I was um, Hocko and uh, and Reynolds with with the horse, and I was delighted for them. Like, yeah, Hocko absolutely was absolutely delighted. Yeah, for when Hocko. So Hocko was a man, like, when we retired, we did a, we retired the same year, me and Hock, and um, we did like a little, it was like a little seminar, and everyone's like, I just want you to, uh, had like a little activity, I want you to look around the room, and I just want you to thank someone for something they've done, and you laugh, and I walked around and saw Hock, and I was like, Hocko, thank you for throwing that dummy, <laughs> turning chairs out, and then running past the back row to score a try, uh, and winning us that origin, and I was like, thanks, mate. I love mm. you. He's a legend hockey. He is. Yeah. He's a top guy in those two. And obviously, 
Uh, they got a bit grubby as well. Yeah. And, Jay Mars and mm, all there's a, There was a couple at Canterbury that you could just see when they came back, they were like, just what it meant to them, you know. Yeah. So happy for And you look what Jane was did on the origin field, like some of the games that he played, he was he was marking up against Greg Inglis mm. most of the time. Like everyone can everyone thinks Greg Inglis is the you know, the where well he is. He is like he's the pinnacle of like athletic centre. And Jane was having covered a lot of time. He didn't really tail him up, didn't make him look bad. Jane was is he's a great great centre. Mm. Played always played great for New South Wales. Yeah, he did. Um, <clears throat> onto other rep football, there was always the the talk. Obviously, when Origin is so competitive, there's so much love, there's so much hate. That when you guys came together for Australian teams, it was a divided camp. You still got the job done on the majority of the occasions, like you say, like when you've got so much skill, like an icy game, and that spine from Queensland would often be the spine for Australia, but yeah. A few of those um, New South Wales forwards would, would come into the mix and whatnot, but was there a divide in the camp? Is that is that fair to say? Massively, massively. It was uncomfortable divide. Oh, really? At times, yeah, at times. Um, like early on, like, yeah, they were, I wanted them to bag them because they were a great side, but like, they, they were very chirpy about how good they were going when they were winning and, you know, they deserved to be. They played great. But, yeah, it's, it was hard to watch them. It was hard to play footy with them. And then one series they actually sang the Australian song, the uh, the Queensland song after he won an Australian game. And that made a fair few blokes pretty angry. Um, there was a big divide. And it probably took that 2013 World Cup to bring everyone sort of back aligned um, because we were away, away for eight weeks together and, had some, there was a few, few pushes and shoves here and there, a few slaps in there, and on the over a couple of beers. But I think you know, it got those out of our system. We had that tour together, and it was um, we actually won it. And you know, I classify those guys as my couple of guys, guys as my good friends. Um, so yeah, I don't. I, th- I think without that series, that without that series, it could have been pretty constant. That. You know, real nasty Australian camps. Mm. That was pretty. That they they'd literally be separate tables. That you know, oh really? Yeah. yeah. You wouldn't. And like, if someone sat at the wrong table, they'd be like, like, fucking, what are you fucking doing over there with them? Fucking come over here. It's like it was pretty. It was pretty narky. But Matt, I can only imagine when a few beers got thrown in the mix. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, everyone starts getting a bit more chirpy when they get a bit, a bit of confidence, don't they? Mm. Is there anyone in particular or...? <laughs> There's a lot of people. <laughs> There's a lot of people. I can't spray too many people. Um, no. Nah. Yeah. We'll leave that one out. Yeah, yeah, f- f- fair enough. <laughs> Keep that off the camera. Um, mate, you you obviously made you, you, your beginnings here. Uh, oh, sorry, here in, in Sydney at the Sharks. Catalan, back to the Titans. I just want to... Get your opinion on on the state of play up there. Um, what, why do you think they've struggled so much? When you were there, they did get to a. We played a couple uh, of semis. A couple of semis. Uh, yeah. I think it was two years ago. They were a pass away from going to week two of the finals, but they've they've found it really difficult to to maintain that level. But yeah, I think it's just been. Um, I think since Cardi left, it's the, it's been a bit of a. The cultural, you know, um, musical chairs with that coaching role. Um, so it's changing. If we get a new coach and it changes, it gets a new coach and it changes, get a new coach and it changes. And it's hard to sort of build that culture when everything's changing constantly. Um, I think, I think um, with Justin there, I think he's a great coach. You know, he's over with your mob over at Saints and, and you know, started a dynasty over there really. Um, um, won a couple of grand finals in a row and that, that team continues to win now. Um, and I think it's taken him a couple of years to with that, that squad up on the Gold Coast, but I'm, I, th- I think I like the way they're playing. Um, you know, led by Tino, I think the way he plays, he's so tough. Um, I think if they get a couple more, you know, a bit more experience in that forward back after you know, experience comes with the games, it doesn't, you can't just click your fingers and, and make it happen. Um, 
a couple of those guys get a bit more experience playing together and I think that team can go far because they, they play with a lot of skill. They've got a lot of skill with, you know, AJ and now Foz there. Um, he brings a lot of leadership into that group. So I think they can be good. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Um, <clears throat> we spoke before about um, a couple of your times in France. Um, the, the second part you were there for a little bit, that was your longest stint, wasn't it? The st yep. stint two. Yeah, I did one year the first time in 2009 and then 2016 I went back for 17, 18, 19. Yeah. And then co coached for two years. Yeah. Um, enjoy your time on the south of France? I loved it, mate. I loved it. And to think I could have been stuck in Bradford if I had got oh, that contract. Yes. <laughs> the first time. Well, I think they they basically went bust. Um, Not long after. Yeah. They, a couple of, yeah. A couple of years after that they, they struggled, but... Um, yeah, I actually couldn't get a visa, English visa. So I got a French visa instead and bypassed Brad sounding beautiful Bradford um, for um, South of France was good. And then, you know, that gave me the, I knew that oh, those relationships that I built in 09, I sort of spoke to the, the Bernard Gosch, the, the president. Uh, I said, mate, when, when I'm finished playing, I want to go home for rep football. That's what I want to go home. You know, and they were all... You know, NRL's great, but you can't play for New South Wales and Australia if I'm playing in Super League. So when that's done, I'll come back. Um, and, you know, I didn't get picked in the test side in 16. And um, it, was all, it was our last series with Origin. You know, Laurie come out and said that you know, me, Robbie and Gal weren't going to be picked the next year. So I was like, I know, I'm, I'm done. Let's see what we can get over there. And ended up getting a five-year contract and... Um, yeah, I loved it. I'd, I'd still be there now if, <laughs> if we didn't have COVID. My wife was locked in the house with the two kids pulling their hair out. Uh, well, it must have been so hard for her. Mm. And imagine I got the luxury of being actually able to go out to training and coach boys for the day and then I'd get home and she was in exactly the same spot I left her because everyone was in lockdown. It was, it was a tough times. How was the um, the crew there? We had, um, did, did you play with Willie Mason there? No, nah, so Willie Mason, they, they had the awesome foursome there before me, which probably ruined <laughs> ruined everything. <laughs> Todd Carney, Dave Taylor, Willie Mason, Justin Horro, we chuck him in there. They had a pretty pretty loose crew. Um, they'd have plenty of Barcelona trips and this and that. Um, they, I think they forgot they were playing. They were there to play real football most of the time. <laughs> it's a beautiful place. That's what, what happens in the Catalans a lot of the years for that period they'd start the season so well because they'd be winter and they'd be training hard and then the, the beach bars would open and then their footy would drop off through the summer and then they would just hope they had enough points on the board to make the semis at the end of the year and limp in um, that was the case here for a long time but um, yeah, I think they they got rid of a lot of those players and they sort of tried to change the culture or the appearance of what it was to play at the Catalans um, with who they brought and um, yeah, they've, they've got some success there now with um, blacks like Sammy Tompkins. He, yeah. he went there. Mickey Mack, he brought um, you know, great players in the Super League for years. Yeah, Young um, Mike they McMeekin, that they've got some decent Frenchies as well. Yeah, they've got some great French like um, Ben Garcia yeah. and um, Bousquet and um, a lot of these guys, um, you know, they were really young when I first got there, but they're like leaders in their team now and... They're doing great things yeah. um, you know, at France, at French level and um, for the Catalans. Uh, they made the, made the grand final. Yeah, they did, yeah. Unfortunately, they missed out, but we won the Challenge Cup um, back in, um, what year was that, 18? So, yeah, it was a good, good couple of years. I think they're going in the right direction. We, were you there in 18 when they – Yeah. Uh, yeah. How, how was that oh, at Wembley? I didn't, didn't play. I got suspended. Oh. One of the suspensions, I was filthy. For a tackle that I didn't even know existed, they call it a ninja tackle. You know what a ninja tackle is? No. Yeah, neither did I. Um, apparently, I, I grabbed him and tried to drag him down. It's actually, they brought it, the rule in in the NRL now. Um, I'm not sure what it's called, like when you uh, put your body... Hip drop. Hip drop, yeah, they call it hip drop. But it wasn't even a hip drop. I was just sort of trying to drag him down mm. backwards. And they said I put pressure on his, his knee going the other way. I was like, yeah. I've been down that tackle for years, but... yeah. 
for some reason that was uh, one of the new rule changes that didn't suit my tackling, tackling style. There's a few of them actually. Um, but yeah, I missed that game. But Wembley was amazing. It was, it was, you know, the history of that place. He went walk through the halls. There's all the photos of the football matches yeah. and the rugby games and you know the Challenge Cups. It's, it's a pretty good stadium. Yeah, um, just want to try and pry some stories from the Catalan days out. If, if what do you, you want? I don't know, mate. Over to you. I think the, the there was you know uh, uh, like every football team has has good times, but I think you know there's something about the south of France. Willie was pretty uh, pretty vocal on a couple, and just um, we um, <laughs> <laughs> we had we had a mad Monday. Mad Monday once. I don't think you tell Mad Monday stories. You let him tell Mad Monday yeah. stories. Yeah, yeah. We had a Mad Monday story, and. Um, um, we finished the game, went, got on the bus and went straight to Barcelona. Um, you know, the bus, the Barcelona's two hours away on a bus, two and a half. And went down the Ad Hotel and we're sitting there and we were drinking. And <laughs> there were blokes getting chirpy and everyone was sort of, everyone's trying to one up everyone that's spraying, spraying people. Um, and then all of the, <laughs> everyone was spraying everyone. And then everyone said, I, like, I don't even care. And then all of a sudden, b- b- people are crying. Like they just they just, they just got overcome with emotion. They were drunk, and and they someone said something that really upset them, and then um, and then this this one of them was a coach. <laughs> he, he was saying, Man, you, "No one's going to say anything to me. I can say whatever I want, and I'm not going to get upset." And then someone said something to him, and he, he started. <laughs> but um, Hosey Justin Horror said something to one of the young blokes, and he was spraying him. Constantly spraying him, and then Benny Benny Garcia, the, the, he was um, you know the upcoming captain of the club. Um, he took he, he was a young French boy, and, and Benny took Ozzy outside and they punched on. <laughs> they punched on. They defended his honour, and, and then um, everything was sweet. Ozzy said sorry for being rude. I don't even know. I think he apologised. He went fuck it. Let's go back to the pub and keep drinking. <laughs> That's the way it was. But it was Barcelona being so close. That it was just so easy. Like you yeah. just get on a bus for two hours and you're in like a massive city. I was just gonna say, like, so obviously being on a lot of bad Mondays, normally you know, more the the dingier pubs. Yeah. How does Barcelona take to you know thirty rugby league players that are ready to charge? Because it it's a big it's a big it's a big nightclub spot. Yeah. But even yeah. like, in, we did you do dress up there? Or? Nah, no, no, dress no ups. dress up. Just no. We wouldn't go in anywhere at dress ups. We just basically, I don't even think I, made, I don't think I even made it to the nightclubs. We just went to the bars during the day. Yeah. <laughs> and But a few of the boys went out at night and kicked on. And it, we, I think we did, what, even ended in one night. Well, that's how close, close it is. You can yeah. stay down there for one night and come home. But no, it was good fun. We did Amsterdam one year. Um, we finished the game, and this is my last year. Um, Finished the game in Leeds, played and flew out of Leeds in the morning to Amsterdam and then had the weekend in Amsterdam and then come back to France and that was, you know, that was so, that's the beauty of Europe. You can just, yeah. you know, you jump on a plane for 45 minutes and you're in Amsterdam You can jump on a plane for 45 minutes here and you're in Bathurst. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, not, oh, beautiful not, Canberra. Yeah, not a knock on Bathurst. No, Bathurst no. is a beautiful place. <laughs> I love the Western, I love the country. I'm a country boy myself. But <laughs> All right. I'd much well, rather Amsterdam. Yeah, well, <laughs> me too. Um, Matt, you can uh, you can hold. <laughs> I'm just trying to get in Amsterdam. Did you dress up there? Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's a bit more yeah, like, like ex- there's more stag parties and stuff there, like yeah. you know, so you can get away with like you just look like a glorified. I remember I'll tell you a funny story though. You know, with the the um, there's a young guy. I'm not going to give his name, but um, he played played a lot of games. Basically, um, he, we were going through a shopping center and he needed to, needed to shit. <laughs> and the French guys are very different. Like they're not they they're just culturally really different. They're very open to things like that. And he just started trying to pull his pants down in the shopping centre while we're getting in, some snacks. In Amsterdam? In Amsterdam. Um, in, just in the aisle. We said, no, 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 we're inside. What, 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 don't. He goes, I need to go, I need to go. 
And we were like, find a toilet. Couldn't find a toilet in there. He was like, we'll go outside and find a toilet. And we're in the, the street with the, the ladies dancing in the windows. <laughs> like, there was, they just did those windows and you walked mm. in, as you obviously know. Um, and you walk down there, we're right on the river. Um, and he just, he goes, I need to go, I need to go. And he just ran straight up against the wall. And it was the door for one of the ladies. So she was in there. And he just pulls his pants down. And she's doing these ones. No, 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 no. Don't do that, don't do that. And, and just did massive turd right, right in front of the door. <laughs> and, and then just goes, ah, oh, it's better. Pulls his pants up. Pulls his pants up. Comes back up to the pub. Um, everyone forgets about it and goes all night. <laughs> and to one of the boys, like they get back in the middle of the night and crash out in bed. And he goes, Did you, have you ever had a shower? Have you had a shower? He goes, no. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and he laid there all night with all with three blokes in the room with, with a shitty ass. Oh, <laughs> that's not on. Yeah, it's cro- that's what I said. That the is young, not on. The young Frenchies that's are pretty cool. form. Yeah. More for multiculture, but yeah. um, <laughs> wipe your backsides, boys. Uh, so we have uh, three questions for each and every guest this year. Um, if football didn't exist or you hadn't made it, uh, what do you think you'd be doing? Um, I don't know, man. What I think I'd be doing, I, was, I could be doing anything. I, man, I got into university as a as a... As I finished, when I finished high school, and this never went. Um, so what were you going to study? Medical science. Really? I had no idea why. I just had to pick something, so I picked that. I had no idea what I wanted to do. All I wanted to do was play footy. Yeah. Um, I used to sing in a band. Did ya? But I could be in a singer, a rock star. But now I can't sing because I got hit in the throat. It sounds awful. But um, no, I don't know, mate. I don't know what I've been be doing. Um, it's really, really funny sort of way to think about it, but I could have been doing anything. Yeah, with, with your voice, will it ever go back to normal? Um, no. Week Wakefield again. We go back to Wakefield. I played a game in Wakefield. Tried to cheap shot a bloke in the back with a swinging arm, and he turned and popped his elbow and just got me right in the throat. And I couldn't breathe for like three months. And then when it actually came back, it came back like this. Um, I couldn't sort of speak, sorry, for three months. I couldn't breathe for like a couple of days. But um, yeah, it's just like one of my vocal cords is frozen and the other one sort of has to work double time to get to, get to it. It's just, it's rough. It's not fun. Apparently you can get surgery to make it a little bit better, but oh uh, well. I reckon get the guitar husky voice. Yeah. Mate, you'll take a over. A bit of Joe Cocker or something. Yeah. 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 I can't uh, play guitar, but... <laughs> Um, who's the most interesting person you, you've met on this uh, on this journey so far? Mate, interesting people. Mate, I met I met, I met, I met um, King Charles once. I wouldn't say he's interesting. He's apparently he's pretty dull, but it's a funny story. <laughs> um, we were at a he come into a, oh sorry the new King Charles yeah oh right okay I was like. It was King Charles, but then yeah, he's, cool. he yeah, was yeah, a prince yeah, back yeah, then. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, is, is he still? Is he? He's not been. He's a king, isn't he? I think technically he's not been um, knighted. Coronation. That's it. Yeah. I know coronation or frozen. Coronation day. <laughs> <laughs> I got two daughters. Yeah, yeah. Oh my god, yeah, I know all about yeah. that as well. Um, um, you yeah, know, yeah, and we went to this thing, and they told us how we had to address him. You don't look him in the eyes. You don't put your hand out. Don't look him in the eye. No. Um, you don't look him in the eye. You don't put your hand out to shake their hand. You don't speak to them unless they speak to you first. You hear all these things and everyone's like, yeah, okay, no worries. And then we went out and played this game. I go back a little bit before that. I wasn't going to go. I went for shabu shabu, you know, Korean sort of where you boil the food. Yeah, yeah. And got food poisoning the night before. And so I was crook for the whole night because I was on the Gold Coast and I had to fly down to do this. Um, it was a lot of the indigenous all-stars team in this big sort of cultural day playing touch footy at the beach at Bondi. And um, I wasn't going to come. I was, Becky's like, you're going to meet, meet Prince Charles. It's going to be pretty cool. I was like, yeah, I'll have to go. So we go down there, we do the, the orientation, um, playing a game, feeling a little bit better. 
um, went over and stood on the, the, the sideline and turned around and Brent Stiles was right, right next to me. And I was like, stuck my hand out and said, g'day, g'day, mate. <laughs> and I was like, this is the second I did it, I'd like regretted, yeah. uh, almost tried to pull my hand back. And he, he just laughed because he, he knew exactly yeah. what I was thinking. Yeah. He just laughed and shook my hand and said, oh, nice to meet you, mate. Um, don't worry about that. I was yeah. like, I'm sorry. And he goes, no, no, I don't care. Uh, he was actually pretty cool about it. He said, he seemed really nice. But that was, that was a pretty interesting person to meet. Musicians for me are probably the most interesting people. Um, being a Newcastle boy, m- met, the, know the guys from Silverchair and they're like one of my favourite bands and, and my wife's friends with his wife, the drummer, but Ben Gillies and, and catching up with him and talking about his music and I, I think musicians are pretty cool. What, what it's about? It's interesting, they can play. You just meet people who are so like talented, like they can play the drums and they pick up a guitar, they can play guitar and they pick up a bass, they can play the bass. And they give it, they give them a mic, and then they can just put it all together and make a song, and just and then make lyrics and put it all, and just make it all work. It's just, I just think they're pretty interesting. When you talk about interesting people, I think mm. musicians are very interesting. Yeah, cool. Um, biggest sliding doors moment. So I think about, you know, what life would have been like if it had maybe maybe made a different choice that I that I look back and think about. So one of those is, you know, for for me, perhaps coming here. To Australia mm. like that. Well, what would I th- sometimes think? What would life have looked like if I'd have stayed? Mm. Um, is a what's the the biggest sliding doors moment in, in your life? Uh, for me, it's probably if I stayed at the Sharks. Um, you know, I went to the Sharks. I intended to stay at the Sharks my whole, whole career, and I was a pretty loyal person. I didn't want to play. Wanted to play for one team. Um, and you know, two thousand and nine, I went over to. to to France and then ended up on the Gold Coast. Um, then met my wife, had two kids. Um, yeah, I wondered what life would have been like if I'd stayed at Cronulla my whole career and, you know, maybe if I was in that position, maybe we won that, I won a grand final, got the chance to win a grand final, but never would have met my, my wife and kids. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's sort of funny to think about what your sort of career would look like, like when it's all said and done if you didn't make that one decision mm. to to leave or yeah it's it's a funny one yeah you would have been the same going to the saints and yeah oh mate yeah. I, I mean it just some it interests me to to look back on decision making decision making processes and mm. you know some of the good unintended consequences and some of the bad like like you say you sometimes you never meet people if yeah, if those situations don't manifest, then yeah, that that was the thing for me. Yeah. The, the the big the big one that's sort of the reason why I can care about staying Cronulla and winning a grand final. But it's more my wife. Yeah, yeah. And my wife getting married, having two kids. Mm. Whether that would have happened if I never got in trouble in Cronulla in the first place, and then got kicked over to France. Yeah. Um. So you just don't know. I guess everything, right. everything happens for a reason. So they say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just just interesting. I think to you know not dwell too much on the past obviously focus on forward but i just find it you know what what little sliding doors moments can do like mm. sometimes you don't realize there are what's going to come of them at yeah, the time pivotal yeah pivotal yeah. points yeah all right well um that about wraps us up i um appreciate you coming on um it's been a pleasure to sit down and Talk with you. It's, I, it's uh, good to know that you don't actually hate me. I was, I was, I was just going to say, Matt. I'm. I think I've just forgive you for standing on my hand, <laughs> but uh, now it's great to to speak with such a, a a character of the game, but also someone that played with so much passion as well. I think everybody admired it. I think even the most staunch Queen Queenslander would 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 observe the Origin games. And go. I like what he's about. I like what he stands for. I like. I, I love what he's trying to do for his team. And I think that's why you got the the respect that you did throughout the whole game, mate. And um, <clears throat> as well, I really really like what you're doing now. Thank you very much. In terms of um, trying to help out those in need, you know, I think people see people see you for eighty minutes, mm-hmm. and there's more to people than that. 100%. I think that's the way people are these days. They assume they know someone yeah. from what they saw, how they saw someone play a game of rugby league. <laughs> they think they yeah. know what, what sort of person you are, what sort of husband you are, what sort of, you know, 
person that you are when you go to work away from, mm. you know. It's um, no one is the way they seem. Mm. Um, no, it's something that I'm really enjoying anyway. Yeah, good. I'm, um, I wish you all the best with that. And if there's anyone out there, just a reminder again, it's... Um, Project Net Zero. Project Net Zero. All right. Cheers, buddy. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate Cheers, it. mate.